Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our second Iranian Studies Initiative um, event for spring 2021. Uh, this is just like our other events. It's, it's in collaboration with the Kevorkian Center here at NYU. Um, uh, specifically, I'm welcoming you to our panel today titled uh, Global 1979, The Limits of Global History. Um, this and, in fact, the next two panels that we will have um, this semester are part of a, a larger project that we've been uh, engaged with for the past couple of years here um, at, the, at NYU or the Iranian Studies Initiative um, that we began actually in 2019. Um, um, we, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, our last in-person set of events that we had uh, were related to this project on Global 1979. Uh, the project began um, as, an, as part of a, a marking of the 40th anniversary of the 1979 Iranian Revolution, where Ali Mirspasi and myself uh, brought together about a dozen uh, researchers drawn from many different disciplines uh, who work on a broad array of uh, topics uh, uh, and sources and so forth. Uh, we brought them together for this 40th anniversary, but rather than kind of imposing a framework upon um, this group of scholars, um, uh, we asked them um, basically to contemplate a series of questions. Uh, specifically, uh, we wanted, to, uh, we asked them, you know, in what sense, if at all, can we think of the Iranian revolution as global? And what does that mean to each of you? Uh, and we asked them how were um, the, uh, how was the revolution of 1979 inspired by other places connected to other people and ideas uh, beyond Iran's uh, national boundaries? And how did the revolution's uh, real, as well as its imagined consequences, reverberate and spill over into larger scales, the world, the universal, or the global? What emerged out of these two workshops that we held, uh, again, in 19, uh, a couple of years ago um, is, um, a forthcoming book that will be published uh, this summer uh, with the same title, Global 1979. Um, and uh, not only does it, I think, or my, I believe as an editor, I believe it offers us a rich new um, set of histories of the Iranian revolution, but also it maps out a whole series of new cartographies, uh, geographies, if you will, and uh, uh, as well as new conceptions of the global. As a collection, um, uh, these roughly 12 essays that we have in the volume, um, they, they grapple with many different issues and topics um, uh, with, again, many different archives, sources, uh, disciplinary proclivities, and so forth. Um, but this, uh, as a whole, the way that the, our authors and the volume understands the global is not one of something that we can think of as some, some sort of planetary coverage or some sort of world spanning set of webs or a boundless set of movements of ideas, people and flows of commodities that generate some sort of homogeneity. We actually actively as a group push back against that. And instead, if I had to distill it, I would argue that the way as a group we, we approach the global is to emphasize three interrelated aspects or dimensions. First, like Iranians in the 1960s and 1970s, we envision a world that is not smooth and is not undifferentiated. In fact, movements are channeled and then designed to hop and skip over some places and land in specific locations or nodes. As such, the glo global is a series of pin, uh, a series of point to point connections to use a, fr a phrase by James Ferguson. Second, we're committed to viewing the global and local as interconnected and even interdependent. Thus, ge geographic scales, local, national, regional, urban, uh, global, are interpenetrating and historical products rather than bounded and timeless abstractions. Third, the global is our method of de exceptionalizing Iran and de exceptionalizing the revolution. Rather than framing the revolution in kind of nativist or insular or particularistic ways. But also, the essays uh, that, uh, that examine Iranian, uh, the uh, three essays we examine Iranian history uh, 
as a totality in which the Pahlavi regime is understood as occupying the same space as opposition groups, religious and secular groups are interwoven, the left and the Islamists are now isolated entities, the urban and the rural are co-constitutive, the Arab world and Iran are interlaced and even mutually dependent and constitutional. So today's panel uh, will explore some of these topics and many others. Um, um, and our, our group of wonderful speakers will uh, reflect on these issues now that they've completed their essays. But let me point out that this is uh, the first of three uh, uh, panels that we've organized uh, for the next uh, month or so. The other two panels, um, just to give you the dates, I'll, I'll maybe say some more about them later, is uh, that we have a panel on March 29th uh, titled Global 1979 um, Geography and Places of Revolution, and a panel on April 26, uh, titled Producing Spaces for Revolutionary Armed Struggle. Um, I, I could, maybe I should mention the, the panelists for those. For the March 29th panel on Geography and Place, uh, we have Golnar Nikpur and Manije Moradian, as well as our discussant, Vita uh, Musavi, who will be um, discussing those issues. And for April 26th, uh, the panel on producing spaces for revolutionary armed struggle, we have Rasmus Elling and Mariam uh, Alem Zodeh, as well as uh, I will be functioning as the discussant for that last uh, panel. Um, so that's uh, enough about what's uh, coming, uh, coming up in the next few weeks. Let me turn to our, um, our distinguished uh, set of uh, panelists. Um, we, our, our panelists, they're three, but they're actually presenting Two, uh, two essays or two of the chapters from the book. Um, the first essay that will be discussed is an essay titled A Sky Drowning in Stars, Global 68, The Death of Tahdi and the Birth of the Iranian. Um, so and this is an essay co-authored by Arash uh, Dalvari and Nahma Sohrabi. So I will introduce uh, uh, both of them right now, uh, but they're just, just for your information, they were each gonna discuss the paper kind of individually. Um, they won't speak over each other. They won't speak at the same time, don't worry. Um, so uh, I, I believe Arash is gonna speak first for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then Nahme will have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes as well. Uh, Arash Dalvari is assistant professor in the Department of Politics at Whitman College. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of California at Los Angeles. His research and teaching interests include modern political theory, history and theory, aesthetics and politics, post-colonial, political theory, and state formation and social change in the Middle East with a focus on modern Iran. In 2013, he co-founded Bitaraf, uh, Bitarof, sorry, Bitarof, uh, a print journal for Iranian arts and writings. Um, his work is forthcoming and has appeared in such journals as Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, Political Theory, and the Inter International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, as well as comparative Islamic studies. He's currently working on a manuscript about thinking re, about thinking the Iranian, about thinking the 1979 Iranian revolution at the intersection of history and theory. Uh, his co-author is Nahma Sohrabi, who is the Charles Corky Goodman Professor of Middle Eastern, uh, Middle East History, as well as the Director for Research at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis uh, University. She is working on her second book about the revolutionary generation in Iran, tentatively titled The Intimate Lives of a Revolutionary, Iran 1979. Her research on the revolution has received fellowships and grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the American uh, Academy in Berlin, where she is currently residing as a Holtzbrink Fellow. She's actually physically in Berlin right now. Uh, last but not least, she's the president of the Association of Iranian Studies. Um, our, our next panelist and the next paper that will be presented is titled uh, Between, Illu Illu Between Illusion and Aspiration, Morteza Avini's Cinema and Theory uh, of Global Revolution. And this is an essay uh, by Hamed Yousafi, who is a PhD candidate in art history at Northwestern University. He studies modern and contemporary art, focusing on the convergence of, uh, of modernism and Islamic mysticism in, in Iran. His dissertation tentatively titled The Secularity 
of the avant-garde and other modernist myths, art and spirituality in Iran during the Cold War, investigates the understudied role of Erfan and Islamic mis uh, mystic, mystic through uh, thought, Iran, Islamic mystical thought play uh, as, sorry, the role that Erfan and uh, Islamic mystical thought has played in the establishment of modern art in Iran before the Islamic uh, rev uh, revolution. As a filmmaker, Hamid has made numerous documentaries, including a series of essay films um, on, quote, the aesthetic history of the Islamic Republic, 1979 to 2009, and the feature length documentary uh, titled The Fabulous Life and Time of Ahmad Fadid, which he actually uh, produced uh, with Ali Misa Farsi. Last but not least, uh, we'll have some comments um, and uh, questions by uh, Brian uh, Plungis. Uh, Brian is a PhD student at NYU's Middle Eastern Islamic Studies program. He has also earned an MA in both film studies and Near Eastern studies from NYU. Some of his current research interests include oil company filmmaking practices in Iran and anti-imperial thought in pre-revolutionary Iranian satire. Um, just so you know, the chat um, section of uh, the Zoom is, is open and is available for you to uh, write up your questions. We will be gathering those uh, during the course of, of the session. And um, I will, uh, I will uh, present those questions to the panelists at the end after Brian's uh, own uh, comments. So feel free at any moment to write up your comments, uh, your, your questions uh, as succinctly as possible. Um, and uh, we, will, we, we should have plenty of time to present them to the panelists and have a conversation um, uh, at that point. Okay, so without further ado, we'll turn the floor uh, first to Arash uh, uh, and then to Nafma to discuss their co-authored essay. Okay, thank you uh, to everyone at NYU, first and foremost, for organizing these talks. And especially a special thank you to Aran Keshavazian and Ali Mir Sapasi for the opportunity to participate in this really wonderful volume. I'm very honored to be on a panel with Hamed Yousafi, whose work I admire. And uh, this session also gives me an opportunity to sing Nahmez praises in front of 171 participants so far. Um, I think she exemplifies the very best truly in collaborative academic inquiry and scholarship as demonstrated by her willingness and enthusiasm to work with me on this chapter. So um, I'm really excited and happy to be here today. All right. A Sky Drowning in Stars, Global 1968, The Death of Tahti and the Birth of the Iranian Revolution is not about the popular wrestler and icon Ghulam Reza Tahti. Rather, it's about the funeral processions held for him after his unexpected death in 1968. What can the Tahdi processions teach us about the Iranian revolution? The Tahdi processions became sites of protests, which we argue established a pattern for mobilization that reappeared a decade later in 1978 during an important phase of the Iranian revolution. Between January 1978 and June 1978, activists also used Chehelon, 40th day mourning ceremonies, to stage protests. At each procession turned protest, state security forces killed a new crop of activists, leading to another round of protests. Events spread across the country, setting the stage for mass demonstrations in the fall of 1978. The article asks a second order of questions concerning conceptual approaches to writing modern Iranian history and to thinking history at large. How might the Tahdi protests illuminate the conceptual frameworks commonly used to understand revolutions in general? Can we write theory from Iran as opposed to taking theory from elsewhere, most often Europe and North America, and applying it to places like Iran? What's the relationship between the general and the specific, or if you prefer, the global and the local? As I see it, our article invites a different approach to thinking about the 1979 revolution. It equally invites a different approach to understanding the uprisings that took place around the world in and around 1968, from Saigon and Tunis to Paris, Prague, Chicago, and Mexico City, a series of events referred to as Global 1968. 
I'll first speak a bit about the policing of social order and later of history that led people to believe that nothing of consequence happened in Iran in 1968 when Tafti died. This will by necessity include a discussion of what happened. I'll then say a few words about how student activists may have come to reinvent Chehelom or 40s as protest events. A rich disruption of categorical distinctions took place, full of clues for an alternate approach to writing, to writing the history of the Iranian revolution, an example of which I think is exemplified by how Nathman and I worked collaboratively on this article. I'll share some thoughts on the limits of global history here. Both of my points transit through Paris in May 68, but ultimately depart from that paradigm as well. Scholars of the Iranian revolution rarely mention the processions turned protests following Tahdi's death. Readers are led to believe that nothing happened in 1968 in Iran, or at least that nothing of consequence took place. This is due in part, I think, to the overwhelming attention given to ideology and analysis of the revolution. A generation of scholars paid disproportionate attention to the 15 of Khordad protests in 1963 and the subsequent exile of Ayatollah Khomeini. And so they told a story about Islamism, either about how a national and secular revolution was quote unquote hijacked by Islamists or about how the revolution was in fact Islamist. As I see it, our article directs discussion of the Iranian revolution to 1968 in addition to, perhaps even instead of 1963. Kristen Ross, <clears throat> who's also teaches at NYU actually, uh, notes a similar pattern in the historiography of the May 68 protests in Paris. Sure, demonstrations took place, but people dismissed them as a momentary outpouring of cultural discontent expressed by students with no bearing on politics because they did not bring about real change. The characterization is brimming with sociological classification, the cultural as opposed to the political, the momentary as opposed to real change, and finally, students, as opposed to other ostensibly political actors like workers. For Ross, scholars who adhere to these classifications are the police of history. The police keep people, places, and things where they purportedly belong to facilitate circulation and order. Scholars mired in categories perform a similar operation at the level of ideas. Ross calls it the police conception of history. Even the most creative interpretation of Chehelom as protests in 1978 repeats this trope despite itself. The fourth chapter of Charles Kurzman's The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran argues that Shia ideology did not inspire 40th day protest events, claiming instead that they were invented in the process of revolt itself. But Kurzman incorrectly dates the origins of that invention in 1963, overlooking the Tahdi protests altogether as if nothing happened. When in fact, the tactic first appeared and developed with Tahdi's death, or so we argue. And I really need to credit Nasser Mohajer here who developed this idea with me and pointed me to some relevant historical sources when I was writing my dissertation. There were two sets of funeral processions turned protests for Tahdi. The first happened on January 13, 1968, the seventh day after his passing or half tom when one set of mourning rituals are customarily held. The second took place on the 40th day after his passing on February 15. Iranian newspapers covered the first event, the seventh, but went absolutely silent over the second, the 40th, a point that Nahmed drew out um, with her archival research. Events on the 40th, which one activist described as a political explosion, exceeded what was intelligible and hence permissible within the bounds of state order. As far as the Pahlavi police state was concerned, there was nothing to see on the 40th. We might ask to what extent does state policing in 1968 of what can and cannot appear in the newspaper before the eyes of the public mirror police conceptions of history in conversations about the 1979 revolution. That is scholarly silence about the Tahti processions. What do we miss as a result? Tahdi's significance arose from perceptions about his moral exemplarity an ethical purity linked to his affiliation with the National Front. As soon as he died, rumors spread as to how and why. As soon as his body was found, the Pahlavi state reported a suicide. We document how people refused to believe those reports, suspecting a state cover-up, or when they did, how they framed the act as an indirect murder caused by state pressure 
And again, another thank you to Saeed Sharif, who brought my attention to an article by Hossein Fekri, the father of Iranian football, um, who penned the first public statement suggesting the Tahdi did not commit suicide. Processions held on Tahdi 7th became an indirect vessel to express discontent with the state. Under circumstances where the state failed to hold any official ceremonies to commemorate an Olympic gold winning athlete, the mere <clears throat> declaration of condolences, of showing up and mourning constituted acts of defiance. And yet, and this is the point, what happened on the 7th was contained defiance, as opposed to what happened on the 40th. There was nothing overtly illegal about mourning someone's death. In addition to newspaper coverage, we see calls from students to attend the seventh day ceremonies, as well as statements of condolence like this one from non-student constituencies, like the youth of Khani Abad, Tahti's neighborhood. Speech at the event of the seventh is monitored to make sure that it remains non-political. Student activists took advantage of the malleability afforded by Tahti's 40th, the possibilities afforded by bringing together people from so many different walks of life under a single banner. They openly chanted for alliances with workers, laborers, bazaaris, and educators, some of whom appeared alongside them to condemn the martyrdom of Tahti. A mix of chants also praised Mossadegh, Khomeini, Tahdi Arani, and Khosrow Ruzbe, while calling for a victorious Viet Cong and the freedom of political prisoners in Greece. While held under the auspices of a mourning ceremony, these events crossed the line of sanctioned behavior, hence their absence in periodicals. How did student activists come to use this tactic to mobilize in response to Tahdi's death? Why January 1968? And why not, for instance, uh, March and April 1967, after Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh's death while under house arrest. In my view, our answers to these questions comprise the article's main contribution. They also draw from and develop the framework Ross used to describe the May 68 protests in Paris. The processions turned protests on Tahdi's 40th were significant because they involved disidentification. Mobilization based on ideology implies identification. We identify with the call of one ideologue as opposed to another according to our given place in society and we mobilize as a result. Disidentification inverts the story. It involves unlikely conjectures across expected, across expected social class identities and categories. On Tahti's 40th, student activists did not mobilize on behalf of their corporatist interests as students, issues like tuition or dormitory conditions. This was not just a matter of criticizing the state or of expressing solidarity with global revolutionary struggles. Students had successfully criticized the state before when it came to student affairs, uh, a local issue. And as Nagmin notes in her prior research, other activist groups later used mobilization for issues beyond Iranian borders, like Palestine, as a viably legitimate cover in military court. What made the Tahdi processions turn protests a disruptive event were its conjunctures, how it combined secular and religious, local and global, students and workers. Seeing events through disidentification helps amend a, a second feature of this historiography about the Iranian revolution. The few who do discuss the Tahdi protests as significant for the revolution cite 1968 to recenter secular activists. But the Tahdi protests invite us to trouble categorical distinctions altogether. Ross too tells a story about students disidentifying with their identity as students to join with workers and the colonized in May and June of 1968 in Paris. This story becomes a kind of standard for talking about Global 68 in celebratory fashion, evidence that something did in fact happen. As I see it, we show a different kind of disidentification, a different kind of conjunction, not just between students and workers, or even the local and the global, but also between the Senfi and the CLC. The term senf literally means guild in Persian, but in practice, and especially in the 1960s, it came to signal any corporatist group in society distinct from what was officially considered political or CRC. An increasingly stark divide between state power and radical opposition to the Pahlavi state opened up a sphere of nominally non-political activity that student activists shrewdly took advantage of as the space 
for semi-formal political opposition uh, as the space for semi-formal political opposition closed, excuse me. At the same time, international student organizations and Congresses increasingly approached a middle position between the two sides in the Cold War, the West defining student activity as non-political and the Eastern Bloc explicitly calling it political. At the universities of Tehran and Tabriz in particular, students organized on behalf of Senfi student interests. Dormitory conditions, tuition costs, curriculum, the academic calendar, and control over the provision of student services. These efforts became pronounced at the end of the 1966-67 academic year after the death of Mossadegh, when students staged strikes in Tabriz and Tehran. The activities covered a deeper hidden political organization connected to the Fadai, and I need to thank two Tabriz University student activists from the time who shared this information with me in detail. Just as importantly, these instances of student activism did not register as riotous, even when protest actions left the confines of university campuses and spilled over into the streets. Organizers were punished with obligatory, obligatory military service at most. The success of Senfi organizing in the spring of 1967 explains the use of Tahtiz Chehelom or 40th to organize protest as opposed to Mossadegh's death nine months prior. Consider Tahtiz's status and significance in contrast with Mossadegh's. The latter was decidedly political. There were no ifs, ands, buts about it. Tahti, however, embodied two activities that could, that could provide cover for political opposition, much like student activism on behalf of student interests, that is, sports and charity. The opportunity to turn simple mourning into political protest after student activists had experienced successful senfisiasi mobilization resulted in unprecedented demonstrations. From this perspective, Iran's 1968 isn't just a specific manifestation of global patterns, but rather by virtue of its specificity, an opportunity to reframe so-called global patterns. Ross, following Jacques Rancière, describes politics as a break from the police order. Rancière's framework invites new interpretations as our reading of the Tahti protests demonstrate and yet its crude application can render possibilities from other parts of the world invisible. Despite his best intentions, Rancière sees a stark difference between common sense behavior before a revolt occurs and the logic that emerges in the midst of revolt. Senfisiasi organizing in 1968 Iran, like the non pori in 1968 Japan, shows how non-political appearances practiced before continue during the disruption of a police order. I'd like to finish by answering the panel's question about the limits of global history a bit further. Global can mean Jahani, covering the expanse of the world across nation state borders, but it can also mean all encompassing. Scholars writing global history can employ a method where copious amounts of facts are marshaled to put history in its place ordering history in the service of political agendas that demand categorical distinctions between good and bad. Contemporary scholars of Iran seem especially prone to these pretensions. Eager to dispute ideology and inaccuracies, we might exalt empiricism and champion increasingly precise categories. Exactitude often involves calls for inclusion. What about so-and-so? You forgot to include X, Y, or Z identity group. I know a fact you don't know, which means I'm smarter than you. You've committed the sin of silence and erasure on a topic I care about, and now I have uncovered your true identity, and so on and so forth. These modes of historical writing, in my estimation, prevent our ability to understand moments characterized by the disruption of categories and challenges to a police order. I'm interested in an approach to truth suited to studying disruptive revolutionary events in truths missed by efforts to put everything in its place, efforts to police history by schematizing. The process of writing this article, I think, offers at least one alternate approach, exemplified by yet another instance of disidentification, in this case, a conjunction between history and theory. We try to make our process transparent for you here today by choosing not to speak in a single voice. Can this method travel beyond one article? Can we write history in a, that, in a manner that welcomes and practices disidentification from our rehearsed identities as historians and political theorists to a whole host of other classifications, 
liberals, Marxists, secularists, Islamists, et cetera, et cetera. If so, I think we might understand the revolution differently and even perhaps precipitate a dramatic change in how we talk about Iranian politics at large. Thank you. Okay. okay so we're going to turn to Nagme to uh, also discuss um, this co-authored essay. All right. Well, first of all, um, thank you both to Ali and Arang for um, putting together this group. We all give thanks at the beginnings of talks for things like this, but this is actually a heartfelt thanks because not only has this process been intellectually genuinely interesting, it's very rare, I think, and I didn't realize how rare it was until I actually came to Berlin and kind of talked to people outside of my small group of people, um, how rare it is to embark on an intellectual project with people who are genuinely you, you, you have a good time talking ideas to, you're enjoying yourself as you're doing it. And the collegiality that was created was definitely um, Ali and Arang's work. And I wanna thank you for that in particular. Um, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna put some uh, Henduna under Arash's armpit soon, but <laughs> let me start out by saying, um, so what Arash and I had decided to do, and I think we need that clarification, is that we got together before the talk and we thought about how can we divide the article? And we decided we didn't wanna divide the article. What we wanted to do is each of us to speak to the theme of the panel without telling the other person what we're doing. And in that way, give a real, what Arash said at the end of his talk, give a real, um, our own interpretation of what we did together. And what you just saw actually Arash do has pretty much been my experience of working with Arash. I would just like randomly put a thought out into the world and just merrily skip along um, in fields of grass for myself. And Arash would come back and do the most thorough, amazing job possible. And my job would just then would be to put like a feather in my cap and keep skipping along. Um, I say that because I mean, I, I am gonna change my comments a little bit because I did such a fantastic job of both summarizing the entirety of the article and also giving his own spin on it. And as he mentioned, um, we're not necessarily thinking exactly the same way when it comes to the meaning of the article that we've put out. And we definitely were not thinking the same way in terms of the methodology that we produced. But I also agree with Arash that this, I, I, I really hope everybody gets a chance to engage in an intellectual exercise the way we did, because as a, histori a historian and theorist, but also as, as Arash pointed out to me when we talked, those categories do not necessarily apply either to us or in general outside the disciplines. But it was, um, we, we both, we have very strong opinions about the things that we know and the way we wanna do things and that we came together and did this was to me just an extraordinary experience. And I wanna thank Arash um, for agreeing to do it. So I'm going to do something a little bit different because, as I mentioned, you already have a sense of what the article was about. I thought it would be, um, I, I, I'm going to talk a bit about how I came to um, the, some of the ideas, why I thought the Tahti um, processions, the 40th of Tahti was important. And I say that because partly it also links into some of the comments that Orang made at the beginning of this uh, session where he talked about the three interrelated ideas that they had of the global. And when I first joined this group, my idea was actually, I was going to talk about military, the, the training that various leftists got in different camps all around the world. And that would have been a particular conception of the global. It was an idea of, you know, these nodes of the global and the interconnectivity and Iranians going to Palestinian camps and Iranians going to Cuban camps. And that's a great idea. But what happened was that um, in the course of writing my article about the Palestine group, I had come across over and over again, the people who I was interviewing or the recollections, people who are writing the recollections about how they became politicized, constantly talking about Tahdi's 40th as something that was galvanizing for them. And it's stuck in my mind because I realized I actually can't even talk, let, 
I mean, the history of the Palestine group, you can't talk about it without 40th. You cannot talk about student activism in the 1970s Iran without talking about Tahrir's 40th. And yet, as Arash rightly mentioned, it's, it's pretty much absent from the historiography of the Iranian revolution, not, not even talking about a global, global framing of it. And I cannot tell you my delight when I ended up having a very long conversation with Arash one day to realize that he also had picked up this idea of the importance of Tahrir's 40th as a turning point, not just that it happened, various histories know, I mean, everybody knows that it happened, but that Arash was also trying to conceptualize it for his own work. And that's basically how the two projects came together. I abandoned the camp thing and Arash and I started thinking about this. So my interest in that coming into Tahti through the Palestine group and trying to figure out along with Arash why it has been historically absent to me fits into the ideas of the global 79 and the importance of using this global framework to talk about the revolution. It, it, it kind of highlights some of these points. Now, um, one of the things that for me it highlights is something that I don't, we ended up not really putting into the article because it just couldn't fit, but a very, very simple, and once you mentioned it, a very basic point, which is that the 40th anniversary, with the 40th of Tahti was the first in some ways and the most successful event in which students and various activists, as Arash mentioned, it was not just students, various activists went out into the streets in Iran in a demonstration and actually were not shut down. Its power actually comes from the fact that it was a demonstration that happened, that there is no, there's no telling of a story afterwards in which there was repression or a roundup, in which you get actually, if you look at a lot of the events that were happening even in the 60s, so the student, the teacher strikes that were happening around 63, 64, these are connected to then stories of repression. It led to them being arrested, going to prison, whatever. But the Tahti 40th, for the reasons that Arash actually mentioned, is one of those events that we miss, but we miss partly because it was so incredibly successful. And in that success, it actually galvanized the students to rise up and do other things, including, for example, create the Palestine group. But I mentioned this simple point because you'd be actually hard pressed beyond another forgotten episode in 1970s Iran, which is the bus, the boycott of the hike and the bus fares in 1970, 71, in which you know, there was a story of success of mobilization, that your mobilization actually led to having the consequences that you as the activist thought you wanted to have. And then after that, the 70s become a story of cat and mouse game between leftist activists, you know, the Islamists, the separation of these categories from each other. And then you don't get any sense of flesh against flesh on the streets again until basically 1978 when the story completely turns. Um, the other reason that I became interested in the Tahti event, and again, this was a place in which Arash and I had independently and through our own ways of thinking come to, has to do with the fact that it highlights in a very clear way the importance of non-official associational student act, act political activity in the lead up to the 1979 revolution. And to me, that actually is one of the reasons why historiographically the Tahti 40ths have been ignored. Um, Arash talked about the role, the, the importance of ideology, ide the emphasis on of ideology in the historiography as one of the reasons why it masks an event like Tahti's 40th. And attach, it, it's a little bit different, but it's connected to that. To me, it has to do with the fact that much of the history of 1970s Iran has been written through an organizational lens. The minute you have the armed groups, the struggle groups, the minute you have the Fadais and the Mujahids, for example, all the history of the 70s, all the mobilization of the students and the workers and the various groups becomes about what were these organizations doing? And it's the same, again, if you look at, if you trace the way in which people talk about what was going on with Khomeini and the various groups, people are talking about the cassette tapes. We're talking about networks that they can see. And what's fascinating to me, and, and again, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why I think this has been ignored is that 
the Tahdi 40th is an excellent example of something that kind of crescendos in 68 with the 40th and never actually goes away, which is the way in which associational political activity was underlying even organizational activity. And what I mean by that is, as, as Arash mentioned, this whole idea of Senfi CSC, which continues into the 70s, and Senfi CSC did include, for example, in the universities, film groups, mountain hiking groups, book reading groups, cinema groups, right? So these are groups that are not officially engaged in political activity, but as, and but they are called by the activists themselves, Senfi CSC, i.e. political associational activities, but they are not formal. And in their lack of formality, they give a flexibility to the kind of activity that those who are part of it can engage in. It allows them to actually flit in and out of organizational work right? And to continue that kind of work, even when organizational work, for example, for the Fadais become clo becomes close to impossible by 1976. Um, and to me, and, and I think this is something that I, I have also learned from Arash, and it's shared between us, in tracing the work that Senfi CSC does and other kinds of um, associational political work does, it allows us to examine what um, Leila Dakhli, who is running another project on the Arab revolutions, and, I, and I, I've been in, um, in conversation with them, and I highly recommend that you check out that project. Um, that project is called Dream, and they have a website and you can look it up. But in describing the Dream project, Leila Dakhli talks about revolutions as a process in and of time and space and not just an event in history. And to me, again, looking at Tahli's 40th from that perspective allows us to look at the Iranian revolution as a process in and of a time and not just as this abstract idea um, in history. I'm just gonna make uh, two more points, I think, and hopefully I'm not going too much over time. I just wanted to quickly highlight from a historian's perspective that I, in doing the kind of work that we did to write the Tahli piece, um, two aspects of 1970s, in particular, late, 90, late 1960s, 70s um, history became kind of an obsession to me. <laughs> if you read the article, you'll see the parts in which my obsession overtakes Arash's obsession. One is that the role that rumors played in, and Arash actually mentioned it very clearly, the specific role that rumors played in um, making Tahdi's death such a galvanizing moment again. But I, I, it made me realize how much we're missing by not actually looking at something as ephemeral as rumors. Um, rumors are the way in which information was, was exchanged. Rumors are one way of thinking about the contingency of events. If the rumors about Tahdi had not spread as they had, I have zero doubt that the 40th would not have been the moment that it became in 1968. And also to me, rumors is the informational equivalent of associational activity. They're connected in that way. They, it's amorphous versus the kind of information that you get in a speech or in a newspaper. And, and the way in which rumors functioned in the Tahdi event allows us to imagine the ways in which it must have functioned and could have functioned in other similar events that we have ignored and probably should be looking for. The second quick thing I want to say is that if you read the article, you see that Arash and I use a lot of Savak documents. And it brought home how much we are missing by actually not treating the treating to have Savak documents as immensely rich sources for social history. And this is something I want to come back to if somebody asks in the Q&A. All I will say about this is, the use of Tzavak, um, this is the Secret Service documents, has become controversial in Iranian studies in the study of the revolution and in the 20th century, the second half of 20th century Iran, for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with the nature of the documents or the value that they provide. It has to do with the fact that you cannot use Tzavak sources because it's been censored, because you don't know what actually was in them. But if you think about Tzavak sources, what are they? They are a they are a product of a bureaucracy. So I would ask informants who were regular everyday people to go and report on their conversations. And it became clear to us when we were reading these sources that not everybody knew actually what they were reporting. 
And as such, they were collecting a much bigger sample of information than the one that, 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 that the Savak, their handler may, may or may not have wanted. And it contains such a rich amount of details about personal relations, about things that were on people's minds. And again, to me, part of the richness of what Arash and I were able to pull out of the 40th anniversary has to do with the fact that we both treated these sources as sources that are legitimate and that can be mined not just for information, but also for conceptual ideas. And, and one of the things that we did that Arash kind of mentioned but moved away from, which I want to kind of emphasize, is the way in which Savax noticed and was talking about what the students were doing in the lead up to Tahdi's um, 40th as a shift in how they are doing something. The tone, the, the word that they use is Nahvi Erdomat, which then Arash linked to um, Ron Sierre's um, logic of revolt. I'm gonna end with some thoughts about, um, I think someone just corrected me about something. I don't know what, but that's fine. Um, I'm just gonna end with some comments about the local and the global. So, I mean, in, in thinking about the connection between the local and the global, I think, I mean, I'm not saying anything that everybody here doesn't know. There's a tendency to measure that connection in terms of either, for example, the globality of ideas so who were local actors reading, for example, that's done quite often and people get excited, um, or the globality of actions. So were these networks, for example, transnational, who were they connecting to? To me, what the work that Arash and I have done together, what this episode highlights, um, and what to me again makes it an integral part of Global 68 and indispensable to understanding Global 79, is what David Scott has called the universality of the local. Now, David Scott defines the universality of the local as, quote, did local characters speak to the world without apology, unquote. In our article, we point out to the fact that from 68 to 78, so 1968 to 1978, you went from slogans such as, you know, um, praise be to the Viet Cong, slogans that are a death to Johnson, um, mentions of what was going on in Greece, a whole slew of global events. And then by 78, the slogans that people are shouting on the street in some ways narrows down and becomes national, even though they carry memories of the global within them. And the example that we use at the end of our article is the neither East nor West, which at the very least can be traced back to Nkrumah, but you know, in the Iranian case, what had been called neither net west nor neither east nor west, but forward in the Iranian case becomes neither east nor west, the Islamic Republic or the government of the workers, something that was national and it was also local to the event. So in one way, if you look at it, you think of it as a shrinking of the global to the local. Now, but our understanding of that is that for the revolution to succeed, it had to succeed on a level of a national imaginary. There are no revolutions, as far as I know, that actually succeeded by saying, you know what, let's go and save the whole world. Now we're going to create a revolution. Um, but I would sort of, sort of tweak our understanding a little bit by bringing forth Scott's dialectic and putting it a bit differently. Um, what we highlighted the Tahti events puts a spotlight on the local to not only see if these revolutionary dreams were universal, but also, and here I think the emphasis would be un unapologetically so. And I think there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that as much as um, these character, local characters were speaking seemingly to national events, they were also unapologetically speaking to the globe of their own local concerns. Um, one word I'll say before I end about the limits of global history, I think the limits of global history are in our field conceptual and methodological. Um, and the very short idea of it is that what we did, I think in our field is that we leapt from national frameworks to just a global one. And we did actually forget the local. 
we stop, we know it, it's, this is not an empiricist argument, but we do not have a social history of Iranian revolution. We do not have histories or ideas of what are happening in places outside of Tehran. We had a national framework of understanding. We undid that national framework for the best and we jumped to a global framework. And if there is a limit to what we can do, it's that by not having actually a local foundation to build our global history with, we are losing the specificity of the place and time. And again, regurgitating the Iranian revolution as an event in history. Thank you. Thank you, Nahle. Um, and we're gonna to transition to uh, Hamid Yusufi who will be uh, presenting his essay. And just to remind you, uh, you can uh, place your questions um, in the chat and we'll collect them for um, the end of the session. Um, okay, thank you, Arang and Ali, for this invitation. And uh, it's difficult to follow Nahma and Oresh, such a brilliant act. But I will kind of start from the end. So what did I think when I was asked to think about the global revolution? And the challenge for me was that each time I was thinking from the beginning about this notion of global revolution, it was directly translating into Persian in my mind into Engelob Jahani. And I wanted to understand this global revolution, not from the perspective of methodologies of global studies, but from the perspective of what does it mean for the revolutionaries to think about Engelobi Jahani. And for people who grew up like me in the 80s and 90s in Iran, my friend Elohim Mohammadi is here, and I think we were kind of sharing this idea that it was on the walls of the schools and everywhere else. And the answer seemed to be rather simple. Engelobi Jahani is global because Islam is global and Islam is going to take over the world. So the way that I wanted to answer this question from the perspective of my work as an art historian was to look at the work that artists created. And in creating these artworks, they address the Engelab Jahani issue as an artistic question. And the challenge here would be the challenge of what is the limits of global history is that Islam specifically, political Islam is not an art historical question. These artists were understanding the global practice of their art through the prism of political Islam, but art history does not have a history or a tools or methods of understanding political Islam. This is quite important because since the inception of the discipline of art history, Islamic art has been central to, Islamic, to, to, to art history. But the transformations of Islam in the 20th century are somehow the kind of scope that art history is blind to. So, both Erfan as a modern notion and political Islam were somehow not questions that art history tackled. But then when I started to look at the artworks that I was thinking about, more specifically, the movies and documentary films produced by a Hezbollah filmmaker, a Khomeinist filmmaker, Murtaza Avini, it became even clearer than this is not the, the globality of revolution. When they talk about Enqilab Jahani, it is not just about Islam. And for this part, here comes the thank yous. It wouldn't have been possible without the collective thinking through the two workshops that we had at NYU and then Columbia, and through weekly meetings that Narmis or Rabi kind of facilitated that we had with Arash and Arang, uh, when somehow the progress of our work was being discussed and I benefited from those conversations the most. Uh, this was the moment that I came to somehow realize that in Avini's own writing, so Murtaza Avini is the person, the artist I'm thinking about, and he is primarily a filmmaker and a writer. In his writing and filmmaking, he specifically writes about Engelabi Jahani quite a lot, but this notion dynamically is produced through his close engagement with what, with what is happening immediately after the revolution in the dynamics of the popular uprisings of the poor throughout the country. And here I realized that there are four different notions of the word Jahani, which are all intertwined in the notion of Engelab Jahani, and that is not reducible to global. Here comes the four notions. I will copy paste them in chat rather than sharing my screen. Um, so there's on the one hand, there is the religious belief in the universality of Islam. That we know we are familiar, that's like the most uh, obvious level of it. The second version of it is that this is the uprising of the poor whose plight is a worldly plight. It's an, in Persian, we call it in Jahani. 
it's, it's not about the ethereal world. It is not about the universality of Islam as a, as a religious belief. It is about somehow the co-option of a Marxist idea of class struggle. The third field is the way that Albini himself was quite Heideggerian in his understanding. And I will explain a little bit more about this because I think the, the scope of Iranian modern art was somehow defined by this somehow understanding of the universal crisis of man. The, the understanding of the world being dominated by, by some sort of uh, what they call it in Persian, mahiyyati insan, the question of mahiyyati insan, the, the discourse on the crisis of man. And the fourth dimension of this is that Albini particularly articulates this as a continuation and a response to the questions of the 1960s and 70s Iranian modern artists about Honari Jahani, about world art, world literature. How can we be part of this cosmopolitan network of being one with the rest of the artists who are creating works in response to the question that modern man faces? So this is how I somehow try to untangle the complicated dynamic of these four areas in Albini's writings and works, but the dynamic of this is always very elusive, constantly changing, because he is articulating this himself in response to the uprising of the poor. So here comes the, the actual somehow reading that I try to offer based on Albini's two major films that he produces immediately after the revolution. One of them is a movie uh, called Bitten by Landlords or Bitten by Landowners, Khan Gazideha, which is about the uprising of the Rashkai tribes in Fars. Uh, the fascinating thing that enabled my work was that Mary Hegland has done amazing anthropological work in exactly the same region. So Albini's film is the perspective of the Hezbollah about what is happening there in the early 19, just right in 1980. The second film is, is a movie that Albini made in the borders of Baluchistan. And, uh, and this is called Gomgashtegane Diyare Faramushi, forgotten, uh, lost in the forgotten land. And this is also important because a lot of Iranian artists and filmmakers in the 1960s had this fascination with the South and produced documentaries about different practices of either formerly enslaved people or even currently at the moment of the 60s and 70s still treated as enslaved people, somehow the black population of the South in Iraq. And Albini's film is quite telling about uh, his difference with the films that are produced in Iran in the 1960s and 70s. I will go into a little bit of detail to explain what is it that defines there in these two films, the Engelabi Jahani the global revolution for Avini through the perspective of a new political subject, which is referred to in Persian as Mustaz Afin or the disenfranchised poor, uh, that replaces the previous notion of man or human in crisis in the 1960s and 70s. So what I do in the article is that I compare these two films, I read them through Avini's own writing with the practices of three rather significant trends or uh, strands in Iranian art history in the 1960s and 70s, which can be broadly somehow categorized under the left, the conservative, and the modernist. So in writing, I can nuance this a little bit more, but here I'm just simplifying it for the sake of the, the oral presentation. The left are those who believe that there's a class struggle happening and the crisis of man to which all of these groups of people are responding, the crisis of man is an economic crisis. We need to resolve the class issue and we need to better the financial and economic situation of the poor. Uh, a very important filmmaker within this uh, strand is Kamran Shirdel. In 1966, Kamran Shirdel makes a series of very important documentaries particularly about the poor in Tehran. What is a challenge for Shirdel is that he is commissioned by a charity organization to make this film, Tehran Paytakht Iranas. Tehran is the capital of Iran. 
along with two other films that he makes about women prisoners and uh, uh, Al A or the uh, the Red District of Tehran. The challenge for Shirdel is that there is no way that he can assign any kind of political agency to the poor that his documentary celebrates. So the documentary is about the poor of Tehran, but the poor are depicted on the border of being dead. So it becomes a call for the middle classes to wake up and see what is happening in their city, but there's no room available for the poor themselves to become political subjects. So the way that the poor politically function is through the kind of call for awakening for the middle classes. So they become a conduit for the middle classes to seize the ailment of the society. That's, that's the problem for Avini of the left. So my reading of Shirdel is also inspired by Avini's own writing about this, these films. The second strand is the modernist strand. The modernist strand is much more well known. The best artworks produced in Iran in the 70s and 60s, still globally celebrated, are within this kind of broadly speaking discourse of deep pessimism about human nature. And the deep pessimism comes from the fact that there's no way that we can have a political revolution, but there are certain contradictions within human nature, within Mahiyate and San, uh, and within modern subjectivity that is divided, that is inaccessible. And that is blocked. So the disenfranchised poor becomes a conduit for these modernist filmmakers as a way of treating them somehow as exotic survivors of a life past. So these exotic survivors make it possible for the modernist filmmaker and modernist artist to see something of the nature of the primitive. And the nature of the primitive is significant because the primitive is where the collective unconscious somehow is buried. So you have amazing documentary films like Nasir Taghwai's Body Gen, or you have films by Parviz Kimiavi who approach Islam or non-Islamic traditions from this perspective to understand something about what is the nature of man. Again, the disenfranchised poor does not have any political subjectivity here except for the fact that it's a survivor of a pre-modern period that makes it again possible for the self-exploration of the modern subject. Kim uh, filmmaking practice is quite fascinating because somehow uh, his position is also extremely critical of the practice of the Pahlavi politics of modernization and the way that the alienations produced by this, by this modernization are at the core of the crisis of man. Um, the, the third strand is the conservative strand. The conservative strand tells and writes about this very specifically that yes, there's a crisis of human, there's a crisis of humanity, but if we return to the divine human nature that God has given us, we will overcome the crisis of modernity. We will overcome all of these transformations that are dividing us and creating all these troubles for us. Sayyid Hussein and Nasr as a theorist of Islamic art and Islamic culture is a very good example of uh, this conservative strand that tells you that we have to return to what they call fetrat or human divine nature. So the Christ of man can be resolved to return to this eternal, already solid, stable core of human nature, which is fetrat or human divine nature. What is fascinating is that for Avini, the combination of the actual uprising of the disenfranchised poor with the ideology of political Islam that Khomeini provides makes it possible that, and we see these in different films, it works through the images of the films. I have tried to somehow analyze the details of how the images themselves bring this commentary up in Avini's early films. And these films are produced before the war. This is quite significant because uh, these films are kind of constantly marred by a celebration of death. And I will explain why, but that is before the war. So it's not about martyrdom yet. It's not about the glorification of martyrdom as a political project. In these early films, Avini finds a combination between Khomeini's political Islam and the actual uprising of the poor through which 
it becomes possible for fitrat to no, to no longer be something which is pre-given. For Avini, fitrat is something that needs a revolution to wake up because, because humans are inherently inclined to find habitation in this world and be happy with the worldly uh, pleasures. What the revolution tells you is that the poor rises up and the poor rises up without any salvation. So the early films are very, very clear about the fact that there's nothing that the revolution can do to make the rise up of the poor into something of the betterment of their nature. The proximity of the poor to death is what makes them an ultimate political subject that can challenge the subjectivity of a modern man as well. And that is how the Fetrat wakes up. The Fetrat is recalled through this political action. And that is how Albini manages to somehow understand Islam not on the side of tradition, but on the side of revolution. So not only he tells you that modern society and modern man is in, in the midst of this crisis that is unresolvable, but he also adds to this that Islam is on the side of this change. It is through the changes instigated by the revolution through Islam that you can recall Fetrat rather than treating Fetrat as pre-given. So this is where the globality of the revolution for Avini emerges because he thinks that the uprising of the poor is going to wake up something which is universal in human being, and that is fetrat, but otherwise buried under this crisis of man. But rather than linking the, the uprising of the poor to economic betterment, Avini completely existentializes this part. Um, and the existentialization is where I think leads to what I have called the illusion rather than the aspiration of the revolution. Because at the end of the day, Avini runs into this contract that the only way that the political power of the poor can be sustained is through constant proximity to death. And that is the contradiction of the revolutionary government for Avini, that you cannot have a government that praises the constant proximity to death rather than the betterment of the economic situation. Um, I will end here, and I hope that in the Q&A we can expand on certain aspects of some of the films. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hamid. Uh, Brian, you have the floor. Great. Um, thank you so much, Arash and Agme. And uh, Hamid, you were all great, and I was lucky enough to be able to read your chapters too, but I'll try to you know, get through some of the comments I have so we can get back to um, questions, because I because I would love to hear more about more of your thoughts about um, what went into making these chapters and kind of specifics of it. Um, really, what I took away, I thought that both of these chapters demonstrated incredibly important strategies and methodologies methodologies for how to carry out the project of global history, which in this volume is discussed as really deeply contextualized and socially situated relational historiography, but really um, in a way that can reveal both its promises and its limits, as you as um, all the panelists have talked about. Uh, at some point. Um, and I think this is a really important project for um, bringing out the best of what area studies can offer. I mean, where I currently am situated, so maybe I'm biased, but in my opinion, both area studies and global history uh, offers a chance not just to engage with local or national space, spaces as like test cases for universal theories. And it doesn't just stress the importance of local spaces because of their connections to the global scale or transnational patterns. Um, both these both area studies and global history attend to the complexities of these interconnected spaces, not just but not just by revealing like nuance and messiness, but as um, Arash pointed out, like disrupting categories is incredibly important. But I think also uh, pointing out unexpected continuities, alliances, and in the position of the local in these kind of lasting patterns. And here, I think the um, the concept of echoes in uh, Arash and Magda's piece is really interesting, and I would like to hear more about that. Um, and also, what I appreciated um, that while exploring these connectivities, all the authors they situate Iranians as inherently and inextricably global. Iranians, Iranian society meaning that they assume to be assume Iranians to be global, but in diverse ways without um, presupposing what the global means to different people um, at different times and how 
and not presupposing how actors and ideas are integrated and circulate within these different connectivities, but you do not have to prove that you're global. It's taken for granted. And it's just how that kind of operates in different moments. Um, regarding the historiography of the Iranian revolution, I think by returning to student activism and political cinema to kind of like uh, well-tread topics of the revolution, they really uh, bring new interesting insights. Um, Arash and Nagme's piece showed that students can't be discussed as a stable identity or one that only occurs on university grounds. And it's certainly not an identity that was just defined in Tehran in the 70s, as they both pointed out. And um, what really struck me, what struck me is that like these young students, they navigate these incredibly complex state definitions of the political and the non-political. And they show a really impressive awareness of the interconnections between the local, national, and global, both in their own lives and under the watchful eyes of the Pahlavi state. So I think it's really interesting how they kind of cut out national criticism, they jump between local and global, but they make sure not to connect them. And that is a really co like complicated nuanced strategy of how to be political in these Sanfi organizations. And Hamid's piece to me demonstrated that um, competing universalisms and aesthetics are not defined in the abstract, but they are developed in specific, in specific spaces in relation to lived experiences um, of both people the state does and doesn't want to be their kind of future project or uh, polit you know, privileged political subjects. And these ideas are in conversation with not just modernity writ large, but you know, notions of citizenship, notions of the developmental state. Um, and I think what also comes across is that what we think of as dialogue doesn't just mean speaking with others, I mean, going and speaking with um, you know, these, these people on the social margins, but it, it can, it's also a competition of who gets to speak and act on the behalf of the marginalized. Um, and I think it also shows that in doing this kind of intellectual history, Engaging with universalisms uh, doesn't mean constructing an alternative grand theory, but you can take it on on its own terms in its own space and see how these ideas get localized and are circulated. And I think importantly, uh, both articles expand the scope of research into the 79 revolution temporally, pushing back to 68 uh, to look at Takti's 40th, um, and connecting global 79 with global 68, and with Avini Cinema pushing the revolutionary period really into what is most like what is um, thought of as the post-revolutionary period. It doesn't just end. And the post-revolutionary era doesn't emerge as a totality, but is shaped by ongoing political and ideological competitions uh, informed before the revolution and with these cos cosmopolitan ideas. And in doing so, they also expand these practice, uh, these uh, this research uh, spatially, and they ground it in specific places. They show how cross-class solidarities develop, not just across universities, but in different cities, and they expand into uh, surrounding neighborhoods. I thought it was great when you're talking about the identity of the students and it's limited you know, socially, but it's not limited ge geographically, and they exploit this to go into the neighborhoods and start um, organizing with, uh, with, with non-students. And then Ahmed uh, shows how these national imaginaries are developed in relation to specific people and how social margins are defined is not in some ab abstract way, but peripheries have to be engaged with in order to be produced as peripheries, uh, whether through art or in kind of political discourse. In terms of the limits of the global project, and I don't think this is a negative, I think this uh, is a positive that I took out, I think both show that even if the local is always connected to the global, this doesn't mean that the global always takes precedent in how these uh, political imaginations or sociocultural social cultural practices are developed. I think we need to expand, and by expanding the timeframes, I think uh, both articles allow us to look at really the shifting intensity of the local, national, and global. So you don't have to always privilege the global as being always there. It gains importance at certain moments. Um, in the piece on Takti, I think they show that political activism kind of loses its global dimension and transitions to a nationalist frame. But then Hamed's PC shows that these nationalist frameworks immediately become reintroduced into the global and trying to think how to uh, carry a revolution on in these kind of universal abstracts. Um, and both pieces undermine, you know, key binaries, I think is like a big project that we all take part of, uh, you know, binaries of East, West, secular, religious, modern, traditional, but they don't undermine these by discussing hybridity as a combination of discrete elements. And they really show how there's kind of a constant overlap to the point of um, where these categories are no longer helpful categories of analysis and they are ind ind indistinguishable at key moments, um, especially uh, with the binary of the secular and the religious. I think uh, the momentary union between leftists and Islamist students at the funeral of a, a non-political the uh, liberal nationalists in Takti or the celebrated propagandist Avini uh, developing his form and style in relation to both leftist and nativ nativist uh, intellectuals who were cosmopolitan and their kind of uh, aesthetics really brings home this point. Um, so those are the pre-prepared marks I had. I just want to congratulate on both these wonderful pieces and maybe I can just pull out um, two questions from the Takti piece and then one question for Hamid too. Um, my first question for the Takti piece, it's really, I've, really appreciated how in, in developing this and kind of rediscovering 
talk to his 40th. It doesn't, it's not set up as a dress rehearsal. It's just something concrete that you find and you just reproduce over and over for the next decade. And you really show how important it is to develop networks, both empirically, like they had to have connections to printers in order to get these pamphlets out. And I think with the rumors, it can be a little bit more um, intangible. And I think that really resonates well with the concept of echoes, which you both put in scare quotes, but I think is really powerful saying, you know, this was happening at the same moment as uh, roughly the same moment as the 68 uh, student protests in Paris, except this one happens slightly before, but it's not about, it's not about first, it's really about kind of patterns and, and establishing this kind of global resonance. Um, so, I mean, kind of vague, but the one question would just be how, how do you think this kind of methodology or of researching patterns or bringing out kind of these partial genealogies can help advance historiography of the 79 revolution or just kind of historiographical practices more generally? And then a, a small question. I, I mean, in your piece, you note that, especially with gender, you say, okay, we, you know, you're looking not at Takti, you're looking at, you know, the procession of, of the funeral. But it's, it's really interesting. It just seems to, and you in the footnote say, you know, we hope somebody else takes up the project of looking at Takti from the lens of gender and class. So I would just be interested maybe if that, if that future researcher is, is in the crowd now, kind of what you found or why, why you kind of avoided going and talking about gender specifically. Um, I mean, there's really great quotes of like, you know, in this country, they don't let people be a man. There's no real men in this country. He was, he was, a, uh, he was a lion and not a house cat. And so this idea of uh, morality and gender and along with sports was really interesting. So maybe if you could just speak to things you had to leave out and things that might be helpful for someone interested um, in those kind of strands moving forward. And then for Ahmed, just to close, um, I was really interested, I mean, in, in knowing Professor Mezapassi's work a little bit, but how this kind of nostalgic rural um, uh, imaginary has to be kind of translated into this future project where it can't just be this archaic pastoral, but it has to be kind of mobilized. You have to mobilize these dispossessed masses. And I think um, in your piece, you say that one of the ways they try to deal with this is unlike Shardell, where you're kind of critiquing the ideology of the state that um, and, and really the authorship of the director is very present, that Avini kind of retreats from authorship and in with these long shots and allowing people to speak, he kind of um, goes into the background, but allows, really gets rid of the um, function of critique and allows kind of the ideology to take over um, kind of what becomes of the film. But I thought that was really interesting because Avini in his work stresses so much about agency, the agency of the poor, the marginalized, the dispossessed, which is, you know, so popular when we talk about film and representation in post-colonial thought. And so you mentioned in the piece how he, um, Avini kind of distances himself or breaks with, you know, mainstream anti-colonial nationalist thought. So I just wanted to ask if you could kind of maybe talk a little bit more about how we might have to rethink post-colonial thinking on agency in art, art history based on the work of Avini um, and how he complicates that. Thank you so much, Brian, for the engagement uh, with the papers. And uh, I suppose, in terms of the question of echoes, we have this, you know, we, we kind of raise a question. We don't really provide an answer, I don't think, which is to say, well, the Tahti protests happened in January uh, and February of 1968, which is five months before the May 68 protests in Paris. Um, is this an example of Iran establishing a pattern that then gets taken up by the Europeans? So then, you know, we, we need to actually invert our lens and prioritize Iran. Or is this an example of networks, you know, connect? And that, that's actually a story of networks and connectivity, which is told about Tunisia and France. Uh, there's another way of talking about Global 68, which I'm sure you're familiar with, where they talk about the spirit of 68, which we mentioned in the article. So then it's just in the air, you know, something's just in the air, which removes us from actual actors. And I would actually um, defer to Nagme and a point she made about the local here, because I think. Um, perhaps in my mind, a clear way of understanding what we meant by echoes and how we explain, you know, these events in January and February um, when there was no precedent elsewhere necessarily, um, is by talking about how people experience things in a local fashion, right? Prioritizing and putting an emphasis on how people prior, uh, experience things in a local fashion. And I think, you know, if I may just add a question onto your question, I think, you know, Nahma at the end of her talk, uh, for me at least, really provocatively brought up this distinction between uh, the local, the national, and the global. And uh, maybe we can use this as an opportunity to dialogue a bit, Nahme. I, I, you know, Mana Kia sent me a question in the chat uh, about the distinction, our distinction between the local and the national. And I'm not sure if at least I was entirely clear on it until I heard your remarks. 
I feel like perhaps in the paper, sometimes we slip between the local and the national. And how you phrased it right now was really interesting and provocative to me that, you know, we've had national histories and then we've displaced that. And now we have global histories, but we forgot about the local, which is where your work is, is centered. So I, I'm actually curious because I wasn't able to an answer Mana's question in the chat. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to how you might think about it based off of the distinction that you were drawing between the local, the national and the global. Because I think you know, there's some, some self critique there in terms of the article where we slip a little bit between the local and the national. So I'm, I'm curious to see where your thinking is. In terms of the gender piece, I think there's a whole really amazing uh, uh, research project there to explore um, in terms of uh, Tahti, his relationship with uh, his wife Shahla, and um, you know the kind of discourse that was circulating about masculinity, um, but again, this is really you know Nahmed's, uh kind of thorough and thoughtful research on the rumors that were circulating at the time. So um, I don't want to take too much time on that. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, I'll just be very honest. I'm not quite sure what is. First of all, before I, I Brian, those were amazing comments. So like. You, you made me see the article in a different way, so I appreciate those comments. Um, so uh, about the local, national, and global, I don't know if, am, am I being asked to define? Because if I'm being asked to define, I don't have a definition. Um, but I know it when I see it, let's put it that way. Um, and I know this sounds like a cop-out, but it's not a cop out because we have not collectively invested the research and the time to conceptualize these things within our historiographic tradition. Um, and I don't want to just, you know, say something that 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 I just thought of on the spur of the moment. And I do mean it when I say it, when I know it, when I see it, I know it. Um, it is empirically based in the sense that there are local actors who are thinking locally, who are shaped by local factors in their decisions. These could be neighborhoods, they could be families. I'm very, very interested in conceptualizing the family as a space of political activity. I think the national, by the time we reach 78 and everybody's out in the street in all parts of the world, uh, in part, uh, all parts of Iran for the most part, we are like, talking about national geographically and we're talking about national on the level of slogans, right? Um, and the global, I think, Arash, like what you what you were taught, what you brought to the table on that specifically with the echo allows us actually to start conceptualizing what the global means. And I think here, and maybe in this way, that is the question that Brian was asking about the way in which the echo allows us to sort of expand its use beyond this particular instance. And what Arash, you did by bringing in the echo is that you made me uh, more comfortable as a historian, I'm very uncomfortable with causality. Um, and so you kind of made me comfortable with the idea of connection that is not sequential. Um, and I think maybe the answer that to Mana's question and the answer to Brian's question is connect that you then passed on to me <laughs> is connected in this way in that maybe this is precisely where people need to pick up this idea and begin conceptualizing the no local, the national and the global. But I go back to my comments, which is to say we it's wonderful that we are theorizing. It is wonderful that we're conceptualizing, but we just don't have enough work on the ground yet to be able to do it in a thorough way. And I wanna point out that this doesn't mean nobody has done any work. I'm not, I, I think, you know, people are thinking that I'm saying, oh, we invented the wheel in no shape or form. But, but I think we need a bit more nitty gritty work done on the 70s on 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 the conditions on the, what people were doing on a smaller scale than ideology allows us to do in order to be able to um, do a better job of of creating the kind of definitions that Mana was asking and the kind of um, consequences or the or historiographical work that I think Brian was asking on the issue of gender I, I will just say this much you know people ask about gender a lot 
And the way I see gender is that it's not about put women in there. <laughs> Gender is, is, is anal it's, it's, it's analysis, it's analytical work. We were not doing that analytical work. We were doing other analytical work. Um, and for us, and we discussed this, Arash, as Arash mentioned, but for us to have gone on a detour to then say there is gender here would have actually done a disservice to the idea of the essential part that gender plays. Right, and the essential work that it requires us to do if we are doing a, a particular type of gender analysis. But our gender analysis is also there. We talk about the figure of Tahti as a Pahlavan. That is a gendered analysis, but we put specifically put that footnote in there because we did get that comment. And to me, that comes from a place in which we are being asked and also add the agenda and also put women in there. And, and I think Arash and I both refuse to engage in that type of knowledge production, but we hope someone does take it seriously. We've put, pointed the way for them to do that and then makes that their analytical project. Ours was trying to bring Tahti into a global framework. Can I jump in on that and just add? I mean, I've also learned from you in the process that um, to answer in this way, which is that by not focusing on the figure of Tahti and focusing on, you know, the life worlds around the event of his death, that's actually performing uh, an analytic that's attuned to a different approach to gender than what has conventionally been a kind of masculinist history that exalts these, these grand figures. And that's something I actually learned from you in the process of writing this. I agree. Um, so about the question of agency of the poor and the post-colonial nature of the revolution and the criticism of that, I think part of it is all of these anti-colonial revolutions, when you have this kind of state establishment, then the question becomes more complicated because the nationalist state is somehow the inter internalization of the logic of coloniality. It's just now happening by ourselves rather than by somebody from a different nation. Um, but for Alvini, so all, nearly all of the political groups after the revolution agree that we have, to dis, we have to talk on behalf of Mardom or the people. And Mardom are not necessarily all of the Iranians. Specifically, Mardom are not all of the Iranians. Mardom are those who were left behind the Pahlavi project of modernization. It was not until Khatani came to power and the Hizb Musharakat that the Jepe Musharakat had this slogan of Iran for all Iranians. Then we came back to a different understanding of Mardom. Um, the way that Alvini articulates this Mardom is kind of quite specific. I argue that this is because we have quite a bit of literature on how leftists thought about the issue of the revolution, um, but we have much less studies of like what Hezbollah has thought about this. And Alvini is one of the Hezbollahis who was very vocal in theoretically writing what he thought in conversation with leftist and non-leftist discourses. So for him, this Mardom has a very specific nature. It's non-Persian speakers, non-urban, um, and it comes from a response to the history of Iranian modern art before because of the fascination of Iranian modern art with the primitive and the unconscious, uh, Avini sees Mardom here. Uh, another Hezbollah who doesn't have Avini's preoccupation with modern art would articulate Mardom in a different way. Um, yeah, so I will stop here, but there are a couple of questions in chat, which I, I can think of answering in relation to this, but I will wait for whenever it's turn to do that. What, uh, uh, Hamid, are you ref referencing um, uh, Negar's question about lump and proletariat? Is that? Yes, Negar and then Bob Aka for COB as well. Maybe just if you could, we will take a couple minutes to kind of respond, uh, well, maybe share your interpretation of Negar's questions to the audience uh, and, and pick that up as well. So, 
Nagar Mutaide is uh, referring to Fanon's notion of uh, idea that the Lompen proletariat uh, can be the best kind of anti-colonial allies, which is a kind of divergence from traditional Marxist theory. Um, for Fanon, the Lompen proletariat have sufficient intellectual independence from the dominant ideology of the colonial ruling class readily to grasp that they can revolt against the colonial status quo. Um, what I can, this is like, I never thought about Fanon in relationship to the notion of Roland Lumpen Proletaria in Avini's film. But one thing which uh, this brought to my mind and I have written a little bit in the article, um, and I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question, is that the, my understanding of Lumpen Proletaria is that it has an urban nature. Uh, whereas for Avini, he is specifically absolutely not interested in the infighting of the revolutionaries in the urban spaces. He has this idea of return to nature, which is a cinematic idea as well, that the landscapes of outside of the town lend themselves much better to the kind of cinematic language that he wants to uh, somehow co-opt or produce. So for him, there are quite a number of uh, Lumpen proletariat characters who are involved in mobilizing the poor in the non-urban spaces. But for him, it's all about the editorializing and this, the Heideggerian interpretation of this disenfranchised poor in non-urban spaces. Um, I hope it answers the question. And for um, Bobak's question about the relationship between death and Fetrat here, and the Islam, so the, the, the next question, Bobak Afrosi of this question is that, uh, can you expand on the notion of illusion and how Alvini came to experience this more specifically through his films or writings? That's one question. Further, how the relationship he articulates between death and fetrat differentiates from the state's ideolog ideological capitalization on martyrdom. So the first thing about illusion is that as early as the mid 1980s, before the way before the end of the war, Avini starts to write a series of articles, which are like 22 part articles about the notion of development and what does it mean for an Islamic government to aspire to economic development. And his problem is that as soon as we start the notion of development, we are distancing ourselves from this key factor of revolutionary life, which is constant proximity to death. Um, the contradiction for him is between uh, what he calls revolution and habitation. And he thinks that development is an ideology of habitation in this world. And revolution is the ideology of constant mobilization. So what is interesting is that the war is a moment in which constant mobilization happens while it is also governable. The governability of constant mobilization is facilitated through the fact that the state also wants the war. But the difference for Avini is that for the, for the ideology of the Islamic Republic, the war and martyrdom is a step towards something else, towards the constant establishment of the state. For Avini, that is somehow a goal in itself. Um, does this mean that he would be critical of the Islamic Republic if he was still alive, which is a question that I normally ask? I'm normally asked. I don't think so because there are also a lot of conservative uh, dimensions to his thinking that he would remain very much committed in support in his support of the Islamic Republic, uh, as specifically the regional uh, expansion of uh, the Islamic Republic's interventions will be up to his interest. But uh, he understands this notion of Fetrat as what he calls Margogahi, or being towards death, the Heideggerian phrase, that the, the war makes it possible that we are constantly aware of death. Thank you. Let me, let me the, we have uh, this quite a number of comments in the chat section, but um, so the speakers can uh, pay attention to that. But let me turn to some of the questions that are posed to uh, Arash and Nahme. Um, uh, maybe we can turn to one, it's actually one set of comments, but there's several questions in there, but um, uh, I think useful. Um, Ali Reza Salehinia asks, um, I would like to ask uh, Nahmasurabi and Arash Dawari, uh, 
how did they consider Tahti's funeral procession a turning point exactly? How did they exactly uh, think of it as a turning point? Um, and in another word, what is the exact difference between um, these processions in 1968 and the ones that uh, we have seen in 1962-63 when the death of the uh, Fazia Seminary students was going to have similar effect had it not been for the repression of the regime, it kind of goes towards answering the question, but I'll let them respond. And then finally, another question, uh, which is in tandem with the theme of the conference, don't they think that revolution as a process through history is already covered within the structural interpretations of the revolution? Or how do they suggest we have to see Iran's revolution with the agency structure theories of revolution? So you can, um, Whoever would like to go first can uh, take parts or, or combine those. Uh, I, go ahead, Arash. If... Sure. Yeah, I think the, um, the question kind of answers itself, the first one. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that uh, Chehelom protests did not take place in 1963, uh, as the questioner themselves notes. And that actually concerns, that, that brings us back to the framework that we're using in our analysis. We're interested in how the actual experience, how the actual process of uh, going through staging protests uh, under the veneer of mourning uh, impacts people and, and how people experience success and how that success then carries over into 1978. So uh, I think that's how 68 is a turning point as opposed to 63 because you actually experience uh, the, the, the process in 68 and you don't in 63 if we point, go back to 63, we're still talking about intentions and ideology. In terms of the second question about agency and structure, I mean, my understanding of those debates is data Scotch Paul versus William Sewell. And I certainly think that there's affinities there between that framework and what we're doing. Uh, I, at least in writing this article, approached it from you know using uh, Ranciere as a framework. And for me, that involves a disruption of, of categories. And as much as Sewell, for instance, pushes at the limits and tries to you know, note the invention of the very concept of revolution, for instance, in his work, he's still trying to categorize and schematize history. And to, an, to a degree, that ends up taming the extraordinary, uh, which is a language that I've, I've learned from political theory literature. And I think what's interesting about you know, playing with Ranciere while reading these archives is exploring the possibilities of disrupting categories as opposed to um, trying to solidify them in more precise fashion. And so I think the agency structure literature still tries to solidify things uh, and establish categories. I'll just add to what Arash said about the first part of the question, which is, I don't understand why we think that there's only one turning point. So, I mean, and I say that to say, to me, if I had to visualize a revolution, to me, a re revolution is the moment in which a big mouth opens and just swallows multiple lines of action and histories and change. And so, you, it is quite possible when doing the reverse genealogical dig that you dig through multiple genealogies and that one genealogy does not actually invalidate the other. And I say that because obviously there's absolutely no doubt that 62, 63 was a turning point, but it was a turning point for a different genealogical line that does eventually lead to the revolution and at times does intersect with the one that we've unearthed, right? Ours is exactly what Arash talked about. It, it, it unearths per, a particular turning point, a turning point in terms of student activism, a turning point in terms of what we have written about, which is here is this protest in which students are um, agitating for non-student requests and is not being shut down. But in no shape or form does it mean 62 and 63 is not a turning point also. It's just a turning point for a different line of historical change and thought. And if I can use my, um, my enormous powers as a moderator on a Zoom meeting, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, here I actually want to underline something. And I'm one of the lucky ones, or one of the very few lucky ones that have actually read all 11, 12 essays. Um, so one of the reasons the title of the book is Global 79's uh, Histories, 
uh, plural and geographies plural is, is to, to, to kind of piggyback on Nachman's point here is, is the emphasis that there are, uh, you know, to approach the history of the revolution as actually histories where you have different sediments and layers or genealogies uh, that are been uh, woven and intersecting in important junctures. I think what's important about 60, uh, 68 is a moment where some of these histories intersect, uh, commingle, inform one another, whatever, however you want to formulate it, uh, but to capture that multiplicity of those histories and to kind of go back to, uh, I thought I, I really liked uh, Hamed's uh, re uh, question or response to uh, Negar's very good question about lumpen and proletariat is that, um, you know, we, we emphasize geographies um, uh, in part because what we're trying to kind of document is that while this notion of this kind of variegated global is being debated, constructed, fought over, whether it's Jahani, whether it's third world, whether it's the Oma Mat, so on and so forth. There are all of these other geographies and spaces that are being produced and, and to, to just kind of pick up and uh, uh, from Hamed's essay, for instance, I mean, this notion of the deprived uh, um, marginal areas of Iran is, uh, you know, the, the Shah, the, the Shah's regime also talked about it, but it really is one of the features of the Islamic Republic. And I think, you know, it wasn't really until I read uh, Hamed's essay that I that I fully understood kind of Avini's role in, in, in kind of producing this notion of the deprived uh, geographic margins. Uh, there are other people who are pushing, people from the left were making these sorts of arguments, of course, but, uh, uh, Ethno-nationalists and sectarian uh, folks were making this sort of argument, but it's interesting that uh, Avini, as a, let's call him a Hezbollah, he was also very sensitive to the, the uneven geographies, social geographies of uh, modern uh, Iran. Um, so I, I do want to emphasize that that's actually kind of part of the overarching objective of the volume is to emphasize the multiplicity of histories as well as multiplicity of spaces and how that produced um, um, uh, over fairly long periods of time. Uh, before I thank the panelists, let me just remind you, we do have two other panels of, uh, dovetailing on many of these themes. Um, take a look at the uh, Kevorkian uh, website, the ISI website. I think there's a link somewhere in the chat section, but uh, please join me in, in thanking our, all our panelists, Arash, Dovari, Nahmed Sohrabi, Hamid Yousafi, and Brian Plungis. Thank you very much. <laughs>